Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Welcome to members of the public as well. First, the usual housekeeping. There are no plans for a fire alarm test this evening, so if you do hear a continuously ringing bell, we've probably got some flames to put out somewhere and we should vacate the building as quickly as we can by the green marked exits, one over there in the public gallery, one in front of me, and one to my right here. Uh, members and members of the public, can we please turn off or switch our mobile phones to silent? And members, we are being webcast, so could you make sure that your cards are plugged in and please speak into the microphone? Uh, finally, ladies and gentlemen, members of the public, can I remind you that this is a meeting held in public. It is not a public meeting. So I would appreciate if you could restrain applause if mem a member says something that you agree with uh, and boos if you disagree with them. I would rather the meeting move forward in an orderly fashion and whilst I could clear the public gallery, I would prefer not to. Moving on then, members. Item one on the agenda, the minutes of our 5th of January meeting. They've been on the table over there for the last half hour or so. Is it your wish that I sign them as a correct record? Thank you very much. I will do that later. Emma. Apologies for absence and declaration of substitutes, Emma. Uh, we have apologies from councillors Brian Adams, Julia Potts, Stuart Stennett and John Ward. We have councillors um, Nicholas Holder and Jim Edwards attending as substitutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Declarations of interest? None before the meeting. Any late declarations, members? No? Questions by members of the public? None received, Chairman. Thank you very much. Before we move on from there, perhaps I should introduce one or two of the key players here. Uh, in, sitting at the round table there to the right is Elizabeth Sims, who is the Development Control Manager. Uh, directly in front of me here, Tim Bryson, our Planning Officer, who has been dealing with this application and to Elizabeth's right, uh, Erica Scarlett, <laughs> our legal beagle. To my right, up here on the podium, Emma Deersley, who is the committee clerk, and on my left is Maurice Byam, who is the uh, vice chairman of this committee. I'm Brian Ellis, and I happen to be the chairman for this meeting. So let's move on then. Item five, we did do that. Questions from members of the public? Yes, yeah. We did, yes. Item five, the chairman to invite the planning officers to introduce the report. Elizabeth. Th thank you very much, chairman. Um, as you can see, members, um, the description of development is on the screen for you and um, set out in full in the report. So I won't uh, repeat it now verbatim. Um, by way of introduction, I would like to briefly set out the context for this application to assist members' assessment this evening. I would then pass over to Tim Bryson, the case officer who will take members through the detailed plans and issues. The application site is shown on the screen before you, and it relates to Brightwell House, a Grade 2 listed building in Farnham, including its historic curtilage. The application is for works of part demolition, extension and alteration of the main building and demolition of curtilage listed structures, i.e. boundary walls, a toilet block and Brightwell Cottage. Now, Tim Bryson will describe the changes in more detail. Importantly, this is an application for listed building consent under the Planning, Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990. It is clearly not an application for planning permission. Consequently, members' assessment should relate to two principal tests. Firstly, the statutory test under Section 16 of the Act requires the Council to have regard to the desirability of preserving or enhancing the character and appearance of the listed building or its setting. Secondly, the relevant national and local policy tests from the Waverley Local Plan and the NPPF critically paragraphs 128 to 134 of the framework. These are set out in full in the office's report and Tim Bryson will explain the assessment against these in his presentation. But in summary, the NPPF requires that the significance of heritage assets should be identified and the impact of proposals upon this significance assessed. 
if proposals are considered to preserve the listed building, i.e. not to cause harm, then there is no requirement on the Council to balance the impact against any associated public benefits. The key point here, members, is that planning matters, other than these tests, are not relevant to the consideration of a listed building consent application. That includes consideration of the principle of the loss of the previous use, the Redgrave Theatre. This is properly a matter for a planning application and not a listed building application. Members will be aware that planning permission was granted for the overarching East Street development in 2008 and then again in 2012. And this latest permission remains extant and can be implemented until August 2015. Therefore, the principle of the loss of the theatre as a use stroke facility has been established, but it is not a matter for members this evening. A members' assessment should focus on the physical assessment of the works on the listed building as I've set out. A further important point is that the current scheme is identical to that previously approved by the Council in 2011. Now, whilst that earliest, earlier consent has expired, resulting in this effective renewal application, this is not an opportunity tonight to revisit the whole Brightwell's development. As I said, that planning permission granted in 2012 is extant. The key test for members, as set out in the officer's report, is what has changed since 2012 and whether any changes mean that a different decision on this listed building consent application could now be justified. The officer's report at page 25 explains that there have been no changes to the actual proposal and no material changes on site. Now, whilst there have been changes to the national policy position with the publication of the MPPF and the MPPG, the thrust of those policies and guidance um, remains the same as that of the predecessor policy document, PPS 5, the practice guide to which is still extant. Therefore, officers advise that there's no overriding justification in, in their view for the council to come to a different view on the current list of building application to the one which it formed in 2011. If members choose to conclude that they want to deviate from that previous view, they would need to support their conclusion with clear justification that there has been a material change in circumstances in listed building terms. Chairman, a, fin a final point that I want to make is that English Heritage, as statutory consultee, does not object to this application. English Heritage has made clear in its correspondence that has been circulated to members that it has some aspirational um, comments about how it believes that the scheme could be improved, but critically, that does not amount to an objection. So they have not objected in the way that they didn't object to the 2011 application. It would therefore, in the officer's view, be unreasonable for the council to take a different view on this application to the same proposals given that English Heritage's formal view is the same as it expressed in 2011. And consequently, the application does not need to be referred to the Secretary of State prior to list of building consent being granted. I trust that background is helpful to members. I'm now going to pass over, Chairman, with your indulgence, to Tim Bryson to take members through the plans in more detail. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Elizabeth. So members, starting off with the site location, um, the site's within the town centre of Farnham. Um, it's accessed um, via vehicles from East Street to the north, um, and the nearest public car park is to the east, uh, known as Dog Flood Way Car Park. Um, as shown earlier, this plan outlines the proposed elements to be demolished as part of the proposal. Um, the Red Grave Theatre um, outlined at the top of the screen there, um, garden walls, toilet building, and Brightwell Cottage. This is the proposed ground floor plan. Um, as stated in the description, the proposal includes um, the conversion to two restaurants. Um, the restaurants, one would be situated entirely on the ground floor and the other partly on the ground floor and partly on the first floor. Um, of note here, um, this is the level up to the proposed extension. Uh, these dots indicate the proposed supporting columns um, where that part would be overhung. Um, the kitchen area at ground floor um, here, along with uh, public toilets here and here. And the proposed first floor plan 
um, largely restaurant dining space to the main building um, with a plant room proposed at the rear uh, along with a kitchen as well. Uh, this is the proposed roof plan. Um, of note here, there are a number of proposed um, alterations to the, uh, to the Brightwell's house, um, largely to reinstate elements that have been original features that have been lost over time, including chimneys, uh, the front pitch roofs here, and two rear pitch roofs here. <coughs> this shows you the existing and proposed elevations, um, largely the south elevation here, um, which is the principal elevation facing currently down Brightwell's Garden. Um, you can see here the outline of the existing theatre um, proposed to be removed and the proposed extension here. Um, you'll note the roof features which I outlined earlier, just here and here. Um, new glazed canopy here, reinstating the windows and the full replacement of roof tiles to the roof. Uh, this is the proposed west elevation. Um, you'll note that the extension does not go beyond the principal elevation at the front. Um, in terms of materials for the extension, um, it's proposed to have a mixture of timber loops, uh timber supporting columns, uh, glazing and bronze metal fascia boarding, sorry, fascia to the surrounding edge. Uh, this is the north elevation. Um, you'll see the existing theatre again there and proposed large single storey rear extension along with the first floor extension. And again here the existing proposed east elevation uh, showing the depth of the proposed extension and reinstatement of some original features here. Uh, this is the toilet block proposed to be removed. Um, it's a small brick and tile structure uh, along the eastern boundary of the site. And here, Brightwell Cottage, um, again a brick and tile building further um, southeast within the site, but again along the eastern boundary. Uh, this is just provides a, a proposed site plan in context with the extant planning permission for the wider East Street scheme. Um, you'll note here the uh, proposed extensions here uh, with the Brightwell House. Uh, just running through some site photographs. So this is the south elevation, uh, the principal elevation. Um, you'll note the theatre structure on the left-hand side. You see it all in, in red brick. Um, you'll note the main listed house there. That's the, the toilet building proposed to be removed. And that's Brightwell's Cottage proposed to be removed. And these are three of the garden walls proposed to be removed as part of the proposal. Uh, this is a view of the, the north elevation. Um, so all this is proposed to be removed. The west elevation as well. And a view from the northeast corner. You'll see just here, the um, rear of the Brightwell's house itself. And this is the east elevation. And a closer view of the southern elevation there. So as outlined earlier, um, in terms of the determining issues of this application, uh, listed building applications are required to be assessed against a statutory test set out in the Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990 and the MPPF. The relevant paragraphs in the MPPF have been set out for members under the Principle of, principle of Development section of the report. Critically, officers consider that no harm has been identified with the proposal to the listed building and thereby some paragraphs of the MPPF, notably 133 and 134, are not applicable in this case. A recent Court of Appeal case has confirmed that local planning authorities should give considerable importance and weight the desirability of preserving the listed building and its setting. The current proposal seeks consent for the same scheme as that determined in 2011. This previous, previous consent is a material consideration in the determination of the current application. 
Notwithstanding this, the assessment of the current proposal on its impact on the listed building heritage asset remains a key determining issue. Having regard to the details in the committee report and the above determining issues, members are therefore advised to exercise their judgment, taking into account the advice from the historic building officer in accordance with the officer's recommendation before them. I'd like to turn members' attention now to the committee update sheet. Um, so since production of the agenda, you'll note we had 15 further letters of objection received. Um, you can see the issues, some of the issues raised and the officer's response to that. Since the production of the update sheet, we have had a further seven letters of objection. However, these do not raise any additional material considerations. There has also been one other further letter submitted from a cinema company registering an interest in the site's location. This point raised by this letter is not relevant to the assessment of the current application. It is more relevant to the, to the um, lawful use, loss of the use, um, which is relevant on the assessment of the planning, planning permission. So having regard to all material considerations, officers recommend this building consent be granted as outlined on the, um, your update sheet. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, we have uh, three public speakers with five minutes each. Um, first, Dr. Lawrence Carter. I believe that the uh, procedure has been explained to you, Dr. Carter. Five minutes, you get uh, four minutes with a green light, one, one minute with an amber light, and then I'll let you finish with a couple of sentences if, when you get the red light. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Thank you for, he for hearing me. I'm going to read two statements of objection. The first one is from the Farnham Buildings Preservation Trust. This application is premature. NPPF paragraph 136 is short but very clear. Local planning authorities should not permit loss of the whole or part of a heritage asset without taking all reasonable steps to ensure the new development will proceed after the loss has occurred. Has Waverley obtained an unconditional contract for carrying out the development? No. Has Waverley completed the compulsory purchase of the necessary land? No. Has Waverley obtained the money? No. Consequently, the Council has no legal basis on which to proceed. You are not in a position to permit the destruction of this heritage asset. Furthermore, English Heritage advises Waverley that the walls, gardens and cottage are part of the setting of the house and contribute to its significance as they provide its historic context and help in understanding its function as a country house for a person of some status. We therefore consider that a better East Street regeneration scheme could be achieved if the historic features that contribute to the setting of Brightwell's house are retained, as otherwise the house will become isolated within a modern development, losing its historic context. In defying this advice, Waverley is setting itself against England's national conservation body. NPPF paragraph 14 states... At the heart of the national planning policy framework is a presumption in favour of sustainable development. And paragraph 5 states, Resolution 42 stroke 187 of the United Nations General Assembly defined sustainable development as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In 1920, Farnham Urban District Council provided Brightwell's Gardens, the Bowling Green and the Tennis Courts for the people of Farnham, a valuable green space in the centre of the town. Councillors, you are the current trustees of this amenity. If a large proportion of Brightwell's Gardens were to be built over and the setting of Brightwell's House obliterated, this heritage asset would be lost forever to future generations. The second statement is on behalf of the Farnham Theatre Association and objections, uh, excuse me, objectors to the demolition of the Redgrave Theatre. On the 9th of January, the website Surrey Online revealed that Crest Nicholson are, after 13 years, still in negotiations for funding and that key enabling consents are due by the end of the year. 
The decision on this application must be deferred until investigations have been made into alternative uses for the Brightwells building and all the EIA requirements are in place. Brightwells House is an integral part of the Redgrave Theatre and the entire complex is listed as Grade 2. Farnham enjoyed a thriving and adventurous theatrical life for over 50 years, which drew its audience from a catchment area far beyond the bounds of the town. Waverley proposes to demolish it to build two restaurants. I can think of at least 17 restaurants within a few minutes' walk of the Redgrave. Two more are no substitute for our theatre, which was created and paid for by the people of the town. Three NPPF policies are ignored by Waverley. Policy HE7 says if a listed building is threatened and holds a special significance for a community, their views should be sought. Policy HE 3.1 asks that a heritage asset, such as a theatre, having potential as a catalyst for regeneration, should be protected. And HE 9.3 asks that reasonable endeavours should be made for charitable organisations to take on the buildings. These views have not been sought and reasonable endeavours have not been made. The Farnham Theatre Association, a charity, can offer expert assistance to tackle the cost of recovering the listed building and, excuse me, and operating the theatre. Andrew Welch, who rescued the Chichester Festival Theatre from bankruptcy, is working on a fresh business plan together with the chairman of the Society of Theatre Consultants, Michael Holden. This plan will be ready within a month and a fully worked up proposal with proper backing can be made this year. Curzon Cinemas is interested in expanding into Farnham and its chief executive, Rob Kenny, sent details of this to all councillors last Friday. Okay, just a moment. A proposal for a theatre and an arts cinema would attract visitors to the town and be a focal point for the community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Carter. Farnham Town Council, Councillor Genziani. That one, yeah. Okay. During the past 16 years that I've been a councillor, East Street has been talked about and planned. Portfolio holders have come and gone, and the current plans approved years ago have grown increasingly unpopular and dated. Many other things over this time have changed. When I first saw the plans, I, as were many other town councillors, were very keen to get on with the development. My children then were youngsters at school looking forward to shopping in Topshop or HMV. Now they are postgraduates buying everything online. Then Tesco's was the largest UK retailer and growing. Now they are cutting back on sites and leaving newly built sites empty. The most prestigious site in the centre of Farnham has been occupied after lengthy refurbishment as a mini department store and swiftly closed down again to become a pound land. Many restaurants have come to the town, taking over shop sites such as Raymond Blanc, Bill's, Coat, um, Lockfine and others. Is there still demand for more restaurants in the East Street development? The Woolmead was still occupied by the Inland Revenue and other tenants, as were the shops below. Now the whole complex is being run down ready for redevelopment. Online shopping is increasingly the norm, with companies like Waitrose in Farnham offering click and collect for John Lewis customers. Click and collect has also started to appear in local stores, so people buying online goods can collect and return items in their local shops in the village without having to journey into Farnham. This is the future for shopping, making the sort of shops envisaged for Brightwells as obsolete as those of the Woolmead opposite. The fact that English Heritage are taking a renewed interest in the importance of this central Farnham site following this current application for demolition is something Farnham Town Council wholeheartedly welcomes. 
Farnham Town Council has frequently supported the Conservation Officer in planning decisions regarding listed buildings in the town. Many applications in West Street have been refused due to an adverse effect on a listed building. If there were to be a revised proposal, it would be more consistent if Waverley looked again at the setting of Brightwell's house, as English Heritage has suggested, and include the gardens, walls and cottage in an amended scheme. Despite all this, I recognise that many councillors here will be thinking that they represent people living far from Farnham, and for them the greater good of Waverley as a whole is an important factor. But I believe that for you, the time has come to bite the bullet and acknowledge that the current scheme is not viable. Farnham Town Council continues to look forward to the refurbishment of the East Street area, including the Woolmead and Brightwell sites. But the world has moved on, and as councillors, don't follow Tesco's example, ignoring change and building empty, unwanted shops. Be bold and decide that this whole scheme needs reappraisal, starting this evening with this application for the demolition of listed buildings. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Mr. Bruce MacArthur. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members, and ladies and gentlemen in the public gallery. My name is Bruce MacArthur. I'm the project director for Chris Nicholson Regeneration. I would like to start by saying that Crest Nicholson remain committed to this scheme. We accept that it has been on a long and winding road. As articulated by Elizabeth, this, the application is being considered under the Planning, Listed Building and Conservation Areas Act 1990. It is not concerned with the planning merits of the wider regeneration scheme, which agreed to the loss of the Redgrave Theatre and remains live. The proposals are the same for the previous two applications for listed building consent. Since the previous approval, the National Pal uh, Planning Policy Framework has been published. The proposals accord with the NPPF policy on designated heritage, heritage assets and with local policy in respect of listed buildings and their settings. The key consideration in this case is securing the viable and sustainable long-term use of Brightwell's house. We do have dialogue with a number of potential occupiers for the, the unit, and they have a track record in, in bringing forward uh, these sort of locations and, and showing them in a, in a uh, complementary manner. Crest Nicholson also has a track record of, of, of bringing forward listed buildings. We've recently opened the Victoria Bridge in Bath after spending a significant amount of money refurbishing it. And I would cite uh, Repton Park in Essex and Greenhithe in Kent, two much applauded uh, residential development schemes where listed buildings have been brought into new, new, new uses and remain viable to the day. We believe the current proposals offer the best solution to provide this and provide Brightwell's house in an appropriate setting in the context of the wider regeneration scheme. I'd like to remind you all of the fly-through, and if you take another visit of that, you can see how the, 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 site, the sighting of Brightwell's uh, is probably enhanced by the, the new scheme. The wider regeneration scheme is appropriate for Farnham in terms of architectural quality. Whilst the detractors may be more vocal than the supporters, every time we have done any form of public consultation in Farnham or the villages, there is also always a significant body of people who say, get on with it. We have secured funding for the scheme with a major UK institution, and we have the key lettings in place. We are working with councillors to close out the scheme and preparing to start on site in this before the end expiry of the current planning consent. If Warren Buffett can't get the uh, winners in and losers in retailing right, it'd be wrong for me to say uh, what is going to happen. But what we do know is across the country, we are seeing towns with a good leisure and retail offer prosper. It is no longer just retailing in terms of bricks. It is no longer 
retailing solely in terms of clicks. It is a combination. The gentleman spoke about click and collect. A lot of retailers in fashion, that's called comparison retailing. You want to be able to touch and feel the product. Those guys are still doing deals. If you just look at the amount of space uh, made available by the likes of uh, Woolworths and others that have demised in the uh, recession, they have ta been taken by a, a number of strong retailers. So retailing is not dead. It is still a very viable proposition. And if you want to send a position, Farnham, to benefit from a leisure economy, then you need to enhance the retailing offer. The scheme provides much needed housing, 239 units, comprising 72 social and affordable units in an area that currently has limited affordable opportunities for first time buyers. It will provide over 650 full time equivalent construction jobs. It provides over 430 full-time jobs at completion, over 30% of which are secured by the current lettings to Odeon, Marks and & Spencers and Wagamamas. It is therefore an excellent opportunity for the housing, employment and leisure prospects of the residents of Farnham, including the younger generation who we have seen across the country are put at serious disadvantage by the uh, current recession and this offers them a glimmer of hope for their future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. MacArthur. Could you switch the microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, I see from my guidance notes the uh, local member has not registered uh, a wish to speak. Uh, members, it did occur to me, of course, that under normal circumstances with Joint Planning Committee, I do read out exactly what uh, the application is. It is written down for you on page five of your agenda. Happy to read it out, but if you would rather I didn't uh, frit away some time, uh, let's move on uh, to uh, members and uh, the debate. Could I just uh, mention, of course, that uh, um, we had one or two fairly lengthy, um, <clears throat> shall we say, speeches at a fairly recent uh, a joint planning committee. The normal rules apply, same as they do for council meetings. Normal time for speaking is four minutes, and only at the chairman's discretion can you come back. I have, uh, I believe, a reputation for being flexible on that, and I will continue to be flexible, uh, but I fear that if we get into the 20 and 25 minute speeches, I will have to um, uh, try and move people on. So I saw Mr. Reynolds, please. Um, well, it's actually by way of a question. Um, on page 20, um, according to the um, agenda paper, it says that Farnham Town Council has no objection, but the speaker from Farnham Town Council obviously did have an objection. I just wondered if officers could let us know which is the correct one. I assume the latter. Yes, it is correct. No, no objections. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is in, in my uh, ward, and uh, I um, have been uh, a supporter of the Brightwell scheme for the entire uh, nearly eight years that I've been a councillor, and um, I, I am very much of the opinion that it's um, good for Farnham, it's e economically very good for Farnham, and uh, during, the, uh, during the eight years, I've spoken to a number of people about um, bright wells and the vast majority uh, say when's it going to start and that seems to be the opinion of the majority of people uh, I've even had people ask me how they can put their names down for a flat so uh, I think that I have um, no doubt in my mind that um, it's good for Farnham and that the application that's before us today which at the end of the day is listed building consent um, is the correct thing to approve and so I've no um, um, really nothing further to say other than that I will be voting in favour. Thank you very much Mr Hill. Mr O'Grady. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I can't disagree with anything that uh, Councillor Hill just said. However, we're not actually here to debate the street scheme, merely to look at this um, listed buildings approval. And as far as I can see, there is no change to the previous consent. It's against an extant planning permission for the overall scheme, and there's absolutely no reason to oppose it. Thank you very much. Mr. Gates. Thank you, Chairman. Indeed, I too will try to stick to the application rather than the overall scheme. Um, the application has been passed twice previously. That seems to me to be a fairly strong material uh, consideration. It seems to me there is no credible or legal reason for refusal. This application preserves the listed building, Brightwell's House. I was mildly interested to see that uh, it appears that actually Brightwell's house is an appendage to the Redgrave Theatre, according to one of the speakers. I'm not sure that English Heritage would quite see it that way. Uh, there is no credible or legal reason for postponement, and even if it was relevant, which I admit it is not, in nearly 18 years, not one single remotely credible scheme has been submitted for the reuse of the theatre space. The CNS scheme is the only realistic or remotely credible way of restoring Brightwell's house. Members, that is the issue. English Heritage have recognised this. I will support the officers. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr Gates. Mr Goodrich. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Chairman. The Redgrave Theatre was added to Brightwell House, as is been mentioned on page 23 in the early 1970s prior to this council coming into existence and I have to say a lot of surprise that actually permission was given for the building which housed the theatre to be added to a Brightwell's house a Ray 2 listed building at the time but it was and of course as is made clear on page 29 we're not dealing with um, objections on the loss of a theatre as a facility, we're looking at this as, as a listed building. I think that uh, the proposals dealing with listed buildings, with the addition of chimneys on Brightwell House and, and allowing it to um, be in, in it, on its site um, so that it's not dwarfed by uh, <coughs> the larger building attached to it, will improve Brightwell House immensely and will look better. Um, and then, of course, as has already been mentioned, uh, this is a matter which is the third time of asking that we've had this before us. There's been no changes in the application, no changes in the um, circumstances, and as I see it, absolutely no reasons why we should change the decision that was taken four years ago and therefore I will be supporting the officers as well. Thank you very much Mr Goodridge. Ms Thompson. Uh, thank you Mr Chairman. Um, I don't have a lot to add um, to what's already been said other than to say my judgment on this um, listed building consent the um, alterations and the um, way that the uh, plans have been put together will enhance the building in a way that um, improves it, particularly um, looking at, at, at removing the building that is the Redgrave Theatre. And that's what we have to look at. We have to look at the built environment and the building that is under this consent and looking at the building, it is an improvement, and I'm very comfortable with going with the officers on this application. Thank you very much. Mr Holder. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. <coughs> when I was a lad in the 50s, I remember being taken to the Castle Theatre in Farnham. I don't recall the play, but I do remember the smell of stale tobacco, torn seat covers, and discarded popcorn containers on the floor. I think we were all relieved when in the mid-1970s it was announced that the Castle Theatre was going to be closed and a new theatre was being built adjacent to Brightwell's house. 
However, despite five different theater companies being asked to take over the running of the Red Grave, the th <coughs> as a new theater was called, all fading, the theater was eventually closed in 1997. That was 18 years ago. Since then, the Red Grave, Red Grave has stood idle and neglected. <coughs> Making a theater pay is hard work in today's environment. To put on a play with West End star billing for a week can cost between 10 and 15,000 pounds. To a large West End theater, such costs can be recovered by the selling of just five rows of seats in the stalls. But to a small country repertory theater, it means the selling of between 300 and 450 seats <coughs> at 30 pounds a ticket. The Yvonne Arno Theatre in Guildford <coughs> will only be putting on one play during the first four months of this year, and that is <coughs> direct from the West End, and that is Twelve Angry Men, starring Tom Conti. The theatre relies on keeping costs down by proposing by producing low-cost productions, such as An Evening with Monty Don or with Dame Joan Playwright, Playwright and has <coughs> formed an association with other theatre companies to perform plays involving resting television actors and actresses. <coughs> it is closed most Mondays and some Tuesdays, and with the loss of Arts Council funding, it just keeps its head above water with the help of a large group of guardian angels and some dozen or so sponsors. The Haymarket Theatre in Basingstoke has all but closed, but opens its doors about five or six times a year for amateur dramatics. I don't believe there is a future for the Red Grave Theatre. However, I am aware that there are some 250 odd residents of Farnham who believe it has. I would therefore, at the conclusion of this meeting, and if the decision of this committee is to grant permission for Listy Building consent for the demolition of the Red Grave, would request a def deferment of one month till the end of February, by which time Mr. Andrew Welsh and his colleagues would have produced a viable five-year business plan with guaranteed funding for the restoration and renovation of the Red Grave from its present state to that of a modern, fully functioning theatre. If such an undertaking is not forthcoming by the end of February, and the applicant has fulfilled all the conditions attached to this application, then at least we can <coughs> authorize the demolition of the Red Grave with a clear conscience that we have at least given the Farnham Theatre Association a clear hearing. I, I appreciate this may not be legally possible, but I'd like it to be discussed. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you very much, Mr. Holder. I'll come back to that. Mrs. James. Chairman, thank you very much. I'm going to take a contrary view, but I'm sure that won't come as any surprise to you or uh, to my fellow members. I do recognise, I'm going to start by saying I do recognise that the design of the extension and the occupancy by the restaurants, well, that's the enabling element, which we all know what that means. It's the way of gifting the money to try and achieve some form of preservation. But the questions for me, starting with, uh, is the preservation by this means, am I comfortable with it? No, I'm not, and I'm not comfortable because of the demolition of some of the other elements which I see as being pivotal to Farnham heritage. Design, is it acceptable? I don't think so. Uh, that's obviously a very personal view, but I think we could do a lot better. And the third test for me, a very important one, is have we exhausted other options, whether it's retention of the theatre or have we looked at other partners? And I don't think we have, and I think we should. The key concern I've got is whether the permission we give tonight would be a material factor for the continued development as the contract and numerous contract extensions have been given. Uh, would that allow to continue and just gain more time? And bearing in mind it has been derided and that this has polarised Farnham's community in terms of support or against. I go back to the point that we've had so many contract <coughs> extensions. I voted no for all of those. But I do still question the viability of Crest Nicholson to deliver. And I don't think I can support a unit of this, the development which somehow kick-starts something that actually needs a very major review and a back to basics and see whether we couldn't do better. And I don't like the idea 
and it's my words, uh, Chairman, that I think by going ahead with this this evening, we effectively then make ourselves hostage for an even longer period to uh, Chris Nicholson. I go back to my last point, if you don't mind. I'm revisiting something. But if Chris Nicholson were not a pivotal partner in this, could we actually look at other options and could we bring forward something that would better preserve this building and be much more constructive to the ongoing heritage of Farnham? So thus, at the moment, I will not be able to support the officers, but I thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. Mr. Morgan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, to a degree, I, I'm somewhat surprised to find myself in agreement with uh, some and not other members here this evening. Um, but I do think that this particular application is somewhat premature. There are no firm, accepted, viable, on the books proposals for Bright Wars yet. There are schemes, um, and Chris Nicholson tell us tonight that they remain committed to the scheme. But, Chairman, I've sat in this place before and heard those very same words from the very same firm um, uh, in, uh, in, in exactly the same words uh, on, on this matter, and I'm beginning to get a little weary of them. Elizabeth Sims told us that we should not consider the wider scheme, only um, the application that's before us. But it isn't possible to consider it entirely on its own because the reason for the application for demolition is in fact the Crest Nicholson scheme for Brighthorns. Once it's demolished, this curtilage um, of what is a listed building will be lost. It will be gone. It should have been better maintained by Waverley so that it wasn't in such a dreadful condition now. And given the millions that have been spent on leisure in this borough in the last few years, um, this would have been a paltry sum by comparison. But that's another issue. Letting a listed building's curtilage deteriorate deliberately in order to be able to demolish it is not an accusation <clears throat> I'm sure could be levied at Waverley. I'm Curious, too, as to why there has been no public consultation about this. It is quite normal with a major public asset that is a listed building to have a public consultation before a demolition takes place. It's not necessary, it's not statutory, but it is normal and a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But I suspect that in fear of a negative result from the public consultation, this has not been undertaken. I fear that if we do go ahead with, this, uh, with, with approval tonight, we will then have committed ourselves to a particular course of action, one which is not yet, um, if it ever will be, a definite course of action. We will have committed ourselves to something that we may regret later if alternative proposals should come forward. It's not necessary at this stage of the development. It could be deferred to a later time. I do not know what the sort of proposals that uh, Councillor Holder has suggested might, uh, uh, might mater what, what they, how they might materialise or if they would materialise at all, but they should be given an opportunity. It will cost nothing to delay this application whatsoever. Chairman, there have been lots of other uh, developments in this area, in other towns, um, with or without the local authority involvement over the 10, 12 years that this one's been in the pipeline, all of which have been completed satisfactorily, but Brightwell's, no, it hasn't. And I'm very, very concerned that we go um, any further whatsoever down an enabling line, um, such as demolishing the curtilage uh, and the Redgrave Theatre, um, until we know where we are with the main, uh, with the main Brightwell scheme. Chairman, both the portfolio holder and the leader of the council at the time that the Brightwell scheme was first initiated have all died. They've all gone. And I do wonder, and I uh, do wonder quite seriously, whether some of us will have died too before it materialises. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr Morgan. Mr Mulliner. Thank you, Chairman. Um, start off with a couple of questions to the officers. Um, 
Is any part of the original Brightwell House being demolished? Um, the only parts are some internal um, walls, um, but in terms of the external fabric, um, it is not. There is nothing. Good. Thank you. Um, is any part of the garden being built over? Uh, under this consent, uh, no. But I'll bring up the extant. That's the extant consent for the wider East Street Planning Commission. Thank you. Um, on the idea of a deferral, um, not only is it um, probably improper for this sort of application, but it's utterly irrelevant in practice. It's open to any third party at any time to come forward to the landowner with a proposal. Um, I can't believe anything will happen within, within a couple of months. So a request for a deferral for a month in practice means that if there really is a business plan to be put forward to Waverley in the next month or two, there is plenty of time to do that. And if it were a real knockout, um, then I dare say it would get proper consideration. But I have to say, um, it is, there's an extraordinary coincidence between the dates of planning meetings and the emergence of proposals to do something different. Um, these things could have come home at any time in the last 18 years, so why now? Um, lastly, I think I heard the gentleman from Crest Nichols say that they had now had, had secured funding, which, if correct, is, I would have thought, a piece of major, major news. Um, I shall be supporting the officers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Blackton. Mr. Blackton. I'm sorry, Mr. Blankton, you did indicate that you wish to speak, and uh, it's your turn. That's a show of goodwill. Um, there are one or two points that worry me about this application, and um, I think that the first thing is that I believe that in some cases they are tending to ignore what is legally required of them to do. And with this, I'm quite prepared to draw swords with uh, Tim Bryson, and uh, we can argue it at some later stage. There's some problems here. I cannot ignore the opinions of some of our residents, and um, they have made themselves quite clear on this. Uh, I know that there are people who say that Farnham is... Uh, the kind of organization where we're divided into two parts, we are not. We are more or less um, talking about the same thing. We, um, even those who are, the, who it, by the urban myth uh, are meant to be dead against the development, we don't like the Crest Nicholson development as it is. We do want the development of Farnham East Street. Now, I have problems with the current plan because there is no current master plan. And this is something we've been asking for for some time. The other, there are other ones. There's nothing about protected species in the statement that has been made by the officer. And there is a law against uh, the disruption of protected species and unfortunately, this is going to apply to bats. Now, I know that the word bats might be well suited to me, but I don't, um, I don't worry too much about that. We have got to obey the law. The next problem we've got is that I have seen no EIA for, as requested um, by the government fairly recently, and although an EIA was carried out probably in 2006 or something like that, I believe that there have been sufficient changes in the meanwhile for a new EIA to be completed and presented. To finish, the government has made it clear how we must apply the law in our decision tonight. 
we know that the impact on protected species has never been addressed. The law makes, it's sorry, has not been assessed, although I know that there is a bat house to be built at some stage, um, and that itself is an indication that retrospectively they have decided to do something about this. Now, since that is used as the mitigation for some of the work that is to be done, then I think perhaps we're putting the cart before the horse because we've got to make sure that that side of the mitigation is agreed before we carry on with the work on which um, the, the stage that we, we must reach before going on to full development of that site. The law makes it clear that where environmental statement is known to be incomplete, out of date, or inaccurate, we have two remaining choices. We can refuse consent on the grounds that the environment statement is demonstrably incomplete, or we can defer our decision and issue crest a notice requesting further information through an updated environment stated, uh, an environment statement. I will therefore be not refusing the thing, but I'm an amend uh, I would require an amendment to defer pending due assessment of VAT impacts and mitigation. So I will be making that proposal. I will not be able to vote with the yes. I will have to come down to a defer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Blackton. Uh -huh. Mr. Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Well, picking up on Councillor Morgan's point, I mean, if we keep deferring and revisiting the scheme, then indeed we will all be dead before we get anywhere. Um, he also says that this is rather premature as an application, but as far as I'm concerned, we seem to be revisiting an application that was granted permission in 2011, so it's not really premature because it's actually merely an application we've already accepted and agreed. Um, a couple of other points. I mean, the public consultation has happened when it came to a planning permission. This is obviously a different thing because we talk about listed listed consent and Councillor Morgan also talks about the millions spent on leisure in, in Waverley but yes these are to improve or build brand new leisure facilities that are all now at full capacity and are being enjoyed and are popular. Unfortunately Waverley spent one and a half million pounds on the Red Grey Theatre um, and it couldn't attract popular people to go and visit it because um, it just wasn't um, a viable entity. So. Um, in terms of this application, it appears to me nothing has changed since we last granted permission, and I see no reason not to accept the officer's recommendation and also that the views of Farnham Town Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Edwards. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, just a couple of quick points. Um, with regard to a viable business plan, uh, we've had 18 years to provide a viable business plan since it closed, but we've not seen anything as yet. Um, and I understand fully Councillor Morgan's um, concerns regarding his health. Uh, I know he's speaking for himself, and I hope he recovers uh, full health in the near future. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any? Mrs. Forizowski. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I will be brief, very brief. Um, but I would like to add that I'd make no apology for representing my residents or the time taken to do so in this meeting or any previous before that. Some of the matters before us are far too important to be curtailed by time. But as I say, I will be brief. Um, can I ask the officers, please, taking into consideration what my colleague has said to me at my right, does this application fulfil the legal obligations um, as mentioned by my colleague, and is it different from the last application? Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Forizowski, for the bre brevity. Uh, members, any further speakers? Let's go back then. Ah, Mr. Hess. Forgive me in advance if I'm being um, facile or, or, or a little dim, but there are two points that concern me, and well, concern me because I, I don't know what the answer is. First of all, is deferring a decision really an option? And I think uh, um, Councillor Forzewski's question will, uh, the answer to that will provide the, the answer to my, to my concern. 
but to build on what Council Fosseski has asked, is there a risk associated with deferring the decision? Does it in any way expose the council to any form of redress or does it upset any other process? So that's my first question. And my second question is that if in fact we approve um, what's before us now, does this close the door to any other plan? And I'm specifically referring to the plan that um, would seem to be available not currently, but within the next month. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will get to the officers in a minute. Uh, Mr. Gates, I think you wanted to come back. Thank you for letting me come back. Well, first of all, just to mention to Councillor Morgan that as the portfolio holder for this particular um, uh, part of the, uh, the scheme, um, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> Um, I don't want to add to what has already been said, but there does seem to be a feeling in some members that the moment we grant this, the bulldozers will move in. This is, of course, utter and complete nonsense. This will have to be part of the total overall scheme. This cannot be dealt with in isolation, and it will not be demolished the moment we give permission, and therefore there is plenty of time for any alternative schemes to be put to the, uh, the um, uh, developers, uh, which, uh, as properly said, hasn't happened in the last 18 years, but, no, but in the meantime, any delay, it seems to me, is wasting our time, wasting the officer's time, and essentially, um, potentially, delaying the scheme, which is, of course, the reason why people want to delay it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. O'Grady. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I just wanted to um, uh, ask the officers for some technical advice, because I'm a little confused by what Councillor Blagden had to say. It was my understanding that when it comes to things like EIA and protected species, these are a matter for the, matter for the planning consent, not the listed buildings consent, and we're only talking about listed buildings consent. Could the officers possibly clarify that? Thank you very much. There were uh, several um, points that I think the officers uh, would need to uh, address. Firstly, the protected species, particularly the, the bats, uh, the environmental, environmental impact assessment, and would there be any problems with uh, uh, deferring this application? Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, in relation to bats, um, the the application is for list of building consent, and as I said at the beginning of the meeting, your judgment is essentially around assessing the impact on, impact on the fabric and the setting of the listed building. However, it is illegal to harm bats, as you know, and um, any, any uh, permission granted would not override the duty on any developer to um, comply with the habitats regulations not to harm a protected species. So that would remain in place in any event. But more importantly, the ecological issues in respect of this site were fully taken into account in the environmental impact assessment on the overarching planning permission. So Councillor Reynolds, I think it was, said that his, or might be Councillor O'Grady, thought that the, um, the link between EIA was just with the planning application. Um, we have to be a little bit careful in that um, this is European legislation which talks about projects. So a very significant listed building consent could theoretically um, require an, an environmental impact assessment. In this instance, as a standalone development, it is not an environmental impact development. It is too small to warrant environmental impact on its own. However, the proposals to convert the building, extend it, and to carry out the other works, of course, are also wrapped up and covered by the main overarching permission, which was subject to environmental impact assessment, and that included consideration of the ecological issues. So, Chairman, the, the, the conclusion on that is that there is no concern for you members that you would be in breach of either the habitats regulations or the environmental impact assessment regulations if you were to grant listed building consent on this tonight. The other um, issue that was raised was about deferral my recommendation would be that having regard to the fact this is an application to assess the listed building, 
that there would not seem to be good grounds to defer the application. If you, for example, were asking for more technical information about the assessment, that you really couldn't make a judgment without that, and I would urge you to um, be aware that, having regard to the fact that ISTA building consent has already been granted twice for this development, it's highly unlikely you could come to that conclusion. But to defer it because there may be further interest in this site by another party, that would not be a reason, I think, reasonably to defer this listed building application. But I'd also refer you to the, the relevant point that Councillor Mullen made, that it doesn't stop any other offer coming forward, if there is one, to approach the landowner. That is a matter outside of the planning process, and that could happen at any time and could have happened at any time over the past several years. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Mr Morgan, I think you wanted to come back. Yes, Chairman, it's just that um, I, I've heard my name mentioned um, once or twice. Um, I, I, do, uh, I would like to say that I'm extremely pleased to note that Councillor Gates is hale and hearty, or, uh, or still with us at any rate. But uh, um, he was not the original portfolio holder. It was a certain Captain Peter Burden, um, who I did know slightly. Um, Councillor Gates was only the architect of the uh, butchering of uh, Councillor Burden's original scheme uh, and produced the abomination that we've had before us recently. <laughs> I, I take it you do not feel the need to exercise your right of reply, Mr Gates. I think I see a shaking of head. Uh, can we go back then, members? Mr Holder, some while ago, in fact, proposed that uh, uh, this application be deferred for one month. Uh, I don't know if there, there is a seconder for that. There is. There would appear to be two. Um, so we have a proposal that uh, the application be deferred for one month, I think you said until the end of February, Mr Holder. Can I see those in favour of that proposed deferment? And those against, please. Fourteen. Uh, so we will not be deferring. Are there any other speakers, members? Because if not, perhaps we could go to page 30 on your agenda and you have the officer's recommendation there that uh, listed building consent be granted uh, for six conditions and uh, I think one informative. Can I see those members in favour of... Chairman, that? can I ask that we have a, re a recorded vote? <laughs> uh, do you have four others to join you? Five others, actually. Um, yes. I fear that... Um, no. Moving on, then. Uh, as I said, members, on page 30, you have the officer's recommendation that listed uh, building consent be granted... Can I see those members in favour of the officer's recommendation, please? And those against? Any abstentions? Permission? Mrs James? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd could you record in the minutes that I voted against, please? I'd like to be named particularly for that. And could I ask one other request? Please, can we stop having the political bum fight and the verbal exchanges? I'd rather we stuck to proper dialogue in the meeting. If as chair you could do that, that would be most appreciated. Nothing else. We don't need any legal advice. So, members, we are finished. Thank you very much, and have a safe journey home.